Well, today we're going to look at where the United States is in Bible prophecy, if at all, what will happen to our beloved country in the near future, and I'm going to give you a far better possibility and far better solution than some are suggesting. Last week we talked about change coming to America, but will it be change for good or will it be a change for evil? Pastor Kevin said the stakes are too high and time is too short for us to sleepwalk through these days. The future of our country may not look like our past and things may change dramatically and suddenly. Before John Paul Jackson went to heaven, the prophet, he gave about 20 points of what he saw coming to America, including some suburban neighborhoods burning to the ground um, because of jealousy of others. He said, because the planet is tilted now, we're on a tilt, the jet streams have changed, and there's, there will be so many catastrophic uh, tornadoes, they're going to have to give another uh, level to tornadoes. Some of them will be 50 miles wide. And he talked about the things he saw coming to America, 20 points, but after each one, he added this phrase, if we don't cry out to God, if we don't cry out to God. And he saw many of the same things that David Wilkerson saw in 1973. He saw many things that Kenneth Hagin in 1963 saw in the future of America. And we talked last week about the predictable future of a nation just based on biblical principle and historic facts. We can predict the future of a nation. And we gave the warnings that God gives to a nation that forgets him. And we talked about how we could be between 2 Chronicles 7.14, if my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear and heal their land. And that is where we're at now. It, cry out to God for this nation. That's why I ask everybody to pray at least one minute for America every day. And we could be between that and Jeremiah 7 when God finally said to them, it's too late, don't pray anymore, don't intercede, it's too late, judgment is coming. I hope we're not at Jeremiah 7 yet. Ruth Thompson visited Washington, D.C. and was very encouraged when she found the prayer meetings going on in the Senate and the House and places in Washington, D.C., which some of our congressmen are joining in the prayers. But as we look around, I have a feeling we're not in America anymore. Now, the one thing we can grab onto that could save America is Second Chronicles 7.14. If, if, circle the word if, my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear an answer and heal their land. 1927, a submarine called the S-4, 40 men on board. There's a book called Seven, 17 Fathoms Deep, the saga of a submarine S-4 disaster by Joseph A. Williams. These sailors, there was an accident off the East Coast and, and the submarine sunk into deep waters. And 40 men were aboard. There was nothing they could do. They're at the bottom of the ocean. Air would run out, and they started tapping Morse code on the side of the submarine. And here's what they said in Morse code. Is there any hope? Is there any hope? Well, rescue crews went down first time it was a failure. The second time they were able to hook up a line but apparently they hooked it to the wrong part and air filled in the front of the sub and flooded with water the back of the subs. Everyone in the back died but the rest of the men were still alive. Now two hours before they finally got an airline hooked up to the submarine to provide air for the men in there 
they didn't hear any more tapping. And when they were able to get aboard that submarine, they found everyone dead, all 40 men. But the strange thing is, there was an oxygen tank full of oxygen that they never used. They had something available to them that would have given them three or four, uh, maybe 12 more hours till that air hose could be hooked up and they didn't use it. We have something God has given us as a lifeline in America that if we will use it, God, he may give us more time. He may give us more time. And I know you're concerned about your future and you're concerned about your family. But the United States stands alone as the most materially endowed nation ever in the world. Where is it in Bible prophecy? Number one, some people, and I don't have a PowerPoint for this one, some people are saying that America is the new Israel. This is a teaching that has its roots in the teaching that there are ten lost tribes of Israel. And these ten lost tribes moved into Britain, Ireland, Scotland, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, and so forth. And they became the Ish nations. Danish, Swedish, British, Scottish, Irish, and all those are the lost tribes of Israel. I wonder if they ever heard of the word foolish. <laughs> and so by extension, the United States is a new Israel because we have our roots, of course, in Great Britain. And, and uh, so they say the United States is the new Israel. I, I, no. Number two. Is America the eagle of Revelation 12? There are people preaching that the United States is the eagle in Revelation 12. When the dragon saw that he was cast down to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. The woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is to be nourished for a time, times, and half a time, three and a half years, from the presence of the serpent. Now the teachers that believe the United States is represented by the eagle because the United States symbol, one of the symbols is conspicuously the eagle, also say that Russia is the bear in Bible prophecy. However, before we start speculating, we should always go back to God's word. We find in Daniel, the bear is Medo-Persia, not Russia. Even if they have a bear as their symbol, the bear is not Russia, neither is the eagle America. The eagle has been a symbol of nations since the Roman Empire. Roman Empire, eagle was the symbol. Assyria, eagle was the symbol. Palestine, eagle was the symbol. 25 nations have had the eagle as the symbol. And if we read this scripture, we all agree the dragon is who? The serpent, the dragon is who? Satan, right? So we're seeing that this particular verse is written in a cryptic way, we understand that the dragon is a code word or the serpent is a code word for Satan. Well, what's the code word for the eagle's wings? As we go back to the Old Testament, we find God always described his care for Israel as a mother eagle watching over Israel. I heard a preacher, it was kind of cute. He said, I'm going to be preaching on Bible prophecy. Let me tell you who's who in the Bible. He said, the bear is Russia, the eagle is America, and the rooster is France. I laughed. I was glad he was preaching prophecy, but I had to laugh. No, the eagle wings of Revelation 12 are the loving care of God who's going to take care of Israel in that final three and a half years, or at least a remnant of Israel. 
So others are saying that America is actually the new Babylon. That when Revelation 17 talks about Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, it's talking about the United States of America. And I've heard some really well, good prepared sermons about America being Mystery Babylon or Babylon. And even though it appears that the United States has become a lot like Babylon in the last 30 years or so, we need to understand Bible prophecy in its context. When we read the entire context, we find out that Mystery Babylon is a worldwide religion that tries to bring all the other religions under one umbrella in the last days. That is Mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. So we see another correlative in Revelation 18 where they say Babylon, where this is what John writes, Babylon the great is fallen. Speaking of this angel saying it, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Now, those with a lower view of America see this as the United States of America. But in reality, remember, in Revelation chapter 1, we're given all the keys for decoding the apocalypse. And he talked about many of the keys being signified or signified. That there would be signs, there would be code words used, and you've got to go to the scripture and let the scripture interpret the scripture to understand what they are. And study just a little bit of history, you'll find out that this first century church actually called the Roman Empire Babylon. It was a euphemism or a code word. It was a word so that they wouldn't get caught speaking about the Roman Empire. It was to covertly depict the Roman Empire. Now the Roman Empire... Even though it died out, it was never overthrown because we're told in prophecy that there will be a new Europe in the last days. That's why Brexit was so important because I believe that it's going to bring a man with a plan that's going to bring solutions and solve problems and there will be a new Europe that was part of the old Roman Empire, the western leg of the old Roman Empire. And from there, the man with the plan will rise and many undiscerning people will really believe he is a man of God. He is a, a Christ of sorts, a savior. And they're going to give allegiance to this man. The Babylon in Revelation is the political seat of the Antichrist and his government during the final Shabuah, that is the final seven years of human government. He will move his headquarters to Jerusalem at midpoint, but Babylon will be the new Europe. It will be the headquarters of the Antichrist government during what people call the tribulation, what Jesus called the tribulation. And others make similar compelling arguments that Babylon is actually New York City. And it's quite possible that, especially in the last year, that we've seen a lot of preview signs of what is to come, making the city a lot like ancient Babylon. But New York City is not biblical Babylon. When we get to Ezekiel 38, we get a little closer to the truth. And that is, is America a young lion of Tarshish? Sheba and Dedan, that is Saudi Arabia. And the merchants of Tarshish, with all the young lions thereof, shall say unto thee, Art thou come to take a spoil? Now this is after the Magog invasion, when Russia, Turkey, Iran, Libya, Old Ethiopia, which is Sudan and parts of Somalia, combined together with a couple other nations, combined together to make an attack on Israel. Saudi Arabia, 
doesn't fight it, and the merchants of Tarshish and the young lions of Tarshish don't fight it. They don't try to protect Israel. All they do is they say, are you come to take a spoil? In other words, they will be so weakened by that time, they'll be able to take no military action to help Israel. All they can do is try to negotiate with questions and criticisms. So something must weaken. Now, when we see the word Tarshish, we wonder what that is. I studied that for years. And you have many different people that have studied history that say that the people of Tarshish are the ones that settled in what today is Great Britain, which makes the Brexit even more important. But it says, the merchants of Tarshish, now I've heard that it may be a city along the Mediterranean, but most historians that have traced out Tarshish find it to be where Great Britain is today. And of course, we are a young lion of Great Britain in the, in the original days. So that is the one place in the Bible that this nation, United States of America, that has been the most materially blessed nation in all of history, the nation that Israel could not have been reborn if it were not for Harry Truman and the United States of America promoting it uh, with the League of Nations. It could not have happened without Harry Truman, uh, who was a lover of Israel. Why? Because his mother read him the Bible when he was a little boy and told him, you must always bless the people of Israel and then you'll be blessed, Harry. And Harry had a best friend who was Jewish and thank God he knew what he was doing. God knew what he was doing. We have been a friend to Israel. There have been a, there's been a real important relationship between the United States and Israel. But at the point when Russia, Turkey, and these other nations come down on Israel, Ezekiel 38 and 39, America will be in no condition to help protect, but America will be weakened. So what will happen to our nation? Why will our nation become weak at that point? I've got several scenarios that are possibilities, and there's one scenario that I believe will be a strong possibility. David Jeremiah said, why is America missing in action in the Bible? Other nations are talked about. David Reagan said, it's likely that America will fall from power and it will be sudden and dramatic. But if it's not sudden and dramatic, we could just disintegrate as a strong nation. Rome went from a state of great wealth and influence into non-existence, and it seemed to happen overnight. It just, it was coming on, and I can give you four books to read on that if you'd like, uh, but based on these four books and the studies of the Roman Empire and its fall, here were some of the problems in Rome that led to the fall of Rome. One, music and songs became rude and vulgar, often involving jokes about sex. Lewd acts and sexually explicit acts were exhibited in the Colosseum. Gambling became widespread as bets were placed on chariot races and gladiator combat competitions. Alcohol consumption grew to massive levels. Homosexuality was accepted and celebrated. Emperor Tiberius kept groups of young boys for his pleasure. Emperor Nero had a male slave castrated so he could take him as his wife. Unemployment of the working class spread due to cheap and foreign slave labor. A perverse outlook on what was right, wrong, good, and evil, a decline in ethics and values, vanishing of acceptable rules of standards or behavior, standards of behavior. Life became cheap, taxes had to be raised, there was heavy taxation, natural disasters occurred, and believe it or not, they faced climate change at that time. Economic troubles, financial crisis, disunity in the nation, government corruption, political instability, antagonism between the Senate and the emperor, weakening of the military, loss of tradition values, and the church 
swerved from evangelism and began prioritizing social issues. And the church coddled and supported idle and unproductive people. Now this is Edward Gibbons in his book, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, puts a big responsibility upon the church because the church just coddled and supported idle and unproductive people. The, they, they were basically, well, I guess I don't have to explain that any further. Unsecured borders finally led to the empire's terminal demise. And get this, mass migration of barbarians into Rome, the Huns, Goths, Vandals, the final death blow to the Roman Empire was inflicted by these immigrants, these barbarians. Does that sound familiar to you? So one, America could just make a gradual decline. That's why we have no power in the last days during the Magog War to help. Number two, here's some dis, dis, depresso. <laughs> but don't worry, we'll get to the espresso, as Pastor Deanne said. Nuclear attack. North Korea has already threatened. Second Peter 3.10 is amazing. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat. Bible scholars are amazed at this verse because they say Peter used precise atomic language about something that did not even exist in his day. Revelation 6, 14. Then the heavens receded like a scroll. When it was rolled up, every mountain and island was removed from its place. The United States, Russia, United Kingdom, France, China, India, Pakistan, Israel, North Korea now all have nuclear warheads. And Iran is trying really hard. So number one, we could just disintegrate as a nation as a result of the moral, the fabric, the moral fabric of our nation. Number two, there could be a nuclear attack. In fact, uh, in John Paul Jackson's uh, prophecy before he went to heaven, he talked about all these things happening, and one of them was that there will be a city in America, and he put the time frame between 2016 and 2020. He said there will be a city in America where there will be the detonation of what he called a dirty atomic bomb and uh, several thousand will be killed. It's going to be devastating in that city. But he said, if we don't cry out to God, we can cry out to God and turn some of it around. The next would be an EMT attack, an electromagnetic pulse North Korea has this capability. China, Russia, and Iran have this capability. Now, what an electromagnetic pulse attack is, everything electrical and electronic goes dead. It's fried. Congress knows the threat. The threat. Uh, Senator Rick Santorum, who ran for president, was the only presidential candidate that really addressed it. When there's an EMP attack, what happens is a device is exploded it can be 200 miles above the United States and it fries the electric grid. Everything electronic, computers, ATM machines, everything is fried, you can't use them. All cars will no longer work unless you have a car so old it has no electronics in it. And then to make it work, you may have to replace the wiring and all. Banks go closed. This could be, number one, it could be an attack from North Korea, China, Iran, or Russia to shut down America. But it doesn't have to be an attack. We're told that if a meteor explodes over the United States in just the right way, that also will produce an electromagnetic pulse that will wipe out all electrons. Can you imagine? Stores will be shut down. Banks will be closed. You won't be able to get your money. You won't be able to get food. You won't be able to drive anywhere. There will be no telephones, no televisions, no radio, nothing that had any electronic circuit. Everything will be wiped out. Communications. Now, that's why I say 
I personally believe that will happen, but I personally believe it will not happen until the final Shabuah after Jesus Christ, the bridegroom, comes for his church, the bride. Now that's a question. I have studied all these different theories about the catching away the church. Number one, all evangelicals believe there will be a rapture. But now there's about five different opinions on when it'll happen. Some say it'll happen at the end of the seven years. Some say it'll happen in the middle of the seven years. Some say it will happen before the wrath of God is poured out. Well, we know that for sure. And, and, and some say it will uh, happen when Jesus comes at the second come. So we got, here's what they're called. Pre-trib, mid-trib, pre-wrath, post-trib, and partial rapture. All those theories in evangelical churches. And I've studied them all. And I've come to the conclusion that only one of them can be right. I mean, I believe there, there will be a rapture in the tribulation time because those two prophets are raised from the dead and ascend into heaven. Right before everybody's eyes, we're told in Revelation. The two powerful prophets operating out of Jerusalem. But I believe there are some Christians that are so messed up, they don't know Bible prophecy, they're actually going to believe, they're going to miss the rapture, they're going to believe that it was the evil people, the haters that were taken. And that the Antichrist and the false prophet will be the two witnesses of Revelation. They'll be the good guys. I've come to the conclusion that there is only one thing that is global and dramatic and sudden and irreversible that can close this church age to start the clock for the final Shabuah, and that is the rapture of the church, the catching away of the church, that in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, we're going to be changed and we're going to be with Jesus. We're going to go to the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb, and then we're coming back with Jesus at his second coming. That's why all the saints are with him. Well, how can the saints be with him if they're not with him? You see two very different events. The rapture of the church, nobody knows the day or the hour. The second coming, we can figure the day or hour if we're here. And here's the thing, what is really convincing. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. He's not talking about the second coming. He's talking about the coming for his bride. Well, how do I know? Because he said, they were eating, they were drinking, they were buying, they were selling. You know what they were doing? They were doing business as usual. It was an ordinary day. Buying, selling, hey, we're having a wedding this week. Hey, party this week. You know, it was business as usual. Then suddenly, the door of the ark went closed. And the rain started coming and the the underground artesian wells started exploding and it was too late that's the parable of the ten virgins the bridegroom is coming and he said only five out of the ten went in and he said why they that are ready will go in there is coming a day when there's going to be a trumpet and they that are ready are going to go in. They that are walking with God like Enoch walked with God. There's going to be the sound of a trumpet and we're going to go to a, another world. But there could be an EMP attack. My personal belief, it will happen in the final Shabua or the great tri or the tribulation period. Number four is another option. Financial collapse, that America may collapse to where we can't do anything financially to help around the world. Before Dr. Je Grant Jeffrey went to heaven, he completed a book, One Nation Under Attack, exposing the diabolical things that are going on behind the scenes in America. I don't know if you read, it was just a news article this week that $6.5 trillion are missing and they don't know where it is. But here's what Grant Jeffrey said. He said, and I quote, the enemies of free market capitalism have launched their final attack. The United States soon will be reduced to an isolated, impoverished country with no influence over international affairs. 
The globalists have to bring down America, level the playing field, so that they can bring in the global government. A former senator speaking at Congress said, actually, the unsecured debt is $140 trillion, which literally means every one of us taxpayers owes $1 million each. David Stockman, who was Reagan's director uh, of the Office of Management and Budget, is making warnings now of a coming collapse. Or, here's another possibility. The United States could become a satellite of the new Europe. If we go too far, too long, and we become too weak, we may have to just become a satellite country of the new Europe that is coming into being. But I have a better and an enormously possible scenario. I call it Grand Revival. Because no matter how dark it gets, Jesus promised, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He said, I'm going to walk with you and work with you. I'll confirm the word with signs following. And as darkness deepens, the light of Christ is going to go bright. As the United States goes down, the church is going to rise up. Here's what Paul said to Titus. We should live soberly, righteously, and in godliness in this present world as we await the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all lawlessness and purify for himself a special people zealous of good works. He said here's two events we're looking forward to. Number one, the blessed hope. That's the coming of Christ for his people. And then the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior. That's when we return to earth with Jesus Christ. The rapture will occur before, th before earth's final hour of terror. If he made sure that Noah and his family were safely aboard the ark before the judgment came, he knows how to take care of you. If he brought Lot and his family out of Sodom before, out of Sodom before and Gomorrah before the terrible judgment, he'll get you out too if you're walking with him. He's going to take his precious bride, the church, to heaven before the judgment time. Now what do we do? Here's a checklist. Are you ready for this? Number one, number one, we have to rise up as ambassadors of another world. We are on assignment by God as ambassadors to this world. Now we have a biblical precedent for God forgiving and sending his spirit. Nineveh, judgment is coming. God said, go tell them they're, that they're gonna be wiped out in 40 days. What'd they do? They fasted, they prayed, they turned to God. And if people listen and turn around, judgment can be softened or even averted as it was in Nineveh. But you and I have to rise up and accept our roles as Paul called us ambassadors for Christ. We are in a foreign land. Our home is heaven. Our confidence is not in Washington. Our confidence is in heaven. Our hope is not in Washington. Our hope comes from heaven. And so as ambassadors, we're hope distributors. When there's hopelessness anywhere, we're to be distributing hope. Because faith cannot operate without hope. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. So all of us must Stand up and take our positions and put your hand on your heart and say, I'm an ambassador from another world. I represent the God of all creation and his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Number two, we've got to love others enough to bring them to Christ. The Bible tells us in 2 Peter 3, 9 that God is being patient, not willing that any perish, but that all come to repentance. There's a gospel out there now that doesn't call people to repent. It's not the gospel at all. The gospel of Jesus Christ requires us to turn from sin, or at least be willing at the start, turn from sin, to repent, 
That is, God, I agree with you. This is sin, and I want to turn from it. Help me. I believe Jesus died on the cross for me. I believe he was raised from the dead. Now save me. Jesus will come in like that. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. But you got to call upon the name of the Lord and you got to be willing to turn around. And we Christians got to be willing to turn from our twisted ways. Number three, stay salty. Stay salty. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. But what good is it? If it, or what good is salt if it's lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. Jesus said, you are the salt. Do you know what salt does? Salt delays decay. It doesn't prevent it. Salt is not a preventative, but it, it is a delayer. People used to put salt on their meat, and it would prevent decay until they could eat the meat. But it would not prevent it from rotting forever. You see, we are the salt of the earth, and we can delay what's coming to America if we're salty. If we're not salty, I guarantee if you're salty, you're going to be controversial. And nobody wants to be controversial because you got people that say, hey, he's a man of God. No, he's a demon-possessed fool. You know you, 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 you know, you type in Billy Graham on Google, and you'll find as many articles against Billy Graham as there are praising Billy Graham. It's ridiculous these days. The People can just put anything anywhere they want. So we got to stay salty. Number four, this is your country. Pray for your country daily. Pray for America daily. That's why I ask you to pray for even just one minute a day for America. This is important. Cry out for the salvation of America. There's such an interesting story in Ezekiel 9. God pulls back the curtain to the spirit world and shows what's going on. The, wickedness going on even in the temple the elders and the priests it, just wickedness in their constant imagination and all all this wickedness and God says okay I'm bringing judgment this city has gone too far it's too late no more prayers are going to be answered it's too late and he told he told the destroying angels to go through and he said don't even where I men women children he said just go destroy the city. But not until. And then he calls another angel. And he said, I want you to go put a mark on all those that are crying out because of the abominations of this city. All those that are vexed and crying out because of the abominations of the city. Put a mark on them. And then when the judgment comes, protect them. Don't let them be hurt by it. You see... Now you can pray for America because you're selfish. You don't want to come under the judgment yourself, honestly. And so God would not allow the judgment to be released until all the people that were crying out against the abominations in that city were sealed by that angel. And when the destroying angels saw that mark on them, they knew not to. And do you know where the judgment started in Ezekiel 9? When the destructive angels were released, it started with the elders. It started with the temple leaders because they were just as wicked as everyone else. And they were doing the same things everyone else was doing. You've heard it said in the New Testament, judgment begins where? In the house of God. That's why our people, God's people, must humble themselves and turn from their Twisted ways, twisted thinking, twisted deeds. And even if we're gone to heaven, our prayers will still be answered that we prayed while we were here. Revelation 5, 8, Revelation 8, 3, Revelation 8, 4. Number five, you must become a diligent discerner of the times. Jesus called them hypocrite, hypocrites that didn't know how to discern the times, the signs of the times. They could discern when the sky is, you know, red sky at night, sailor's delight, red sky in morning, sailor's warning. Ah, you can, dis you can discern the face of the sky, but you can't discern 
the signs of the times. He called them hypocrites. This is why the study of prophecy is so imperative in these days. We're getting very close. And Jesus said, watch therefore, always, and pray that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that will happen and stand before the Son of Man. Number six, and this is important, the least you can do as a Christian is vote. Vote. And I would encourage many of you to go beyond that. Get on the school board. Start running for city council, township council. But isn't politics dirty? It depends on who it is. If we don't become the salt, we can't stop the decay. Vote. And remember, there's no perfect candidate the best thing every Christian can do is say, God, I don't want to be led by my emotions. I don't want to be led by my peers. I don't want to be led by uh, the opinions. I don't want to be led by how I voted all my life. I want to be led by your spirit. There's a true Christian right there. And say, Holy Spirit, how do I vote on this? There are some issues I don't know how to vote on. I pray, God, how do I vote on this? And I wait for a word of knowledge from the Holy Spirit. And even though I don't understand it, I believe he knows things I don't know. And there's a reason I don't know. And I believe strongly that if we do these, these things and, and finally walk with God, as Enoch walked with God. Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him, Genesis 5, 24. By faith, Enoch was taken away that he did not see death. This was a rapture before the rapture. He was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. And it is only faith that pleases God. And our faith has to be in the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our faith has to be in his word, not the opinions of people. And if we do these things that I suggested to you today, <clears throat> I believe with all my heart, we're going to be a 21st century church with first century power. I believe that there is the potential of an unleashing of God's glory in our day and in our nation that will carry an anointing that will eclipse all past generations. It's arriving now. And we can take it or we can leave it. Jennifer LeClaire is a writer for Charisma. And she has a great blog and great articles. If you sign up for Charisma Media, in fact, one of mine was, was in there the other day on Strong Delusion. But she's a discerner of the times and she's very prophetic. She's like a seer. And she found an old tape an old uh, message from 1963 by Kenneth E. Hagen, who's in heaven now, when he saw a vision of America in the future. It sounded like he was looking at today. He talked about atheism, socialism, making great inroads into America. He talked about racial tensions, and a number of things that look a lot like this year in which we're living. And he cried out, God, is there any hope? And God said, evil men will wax worse and worse and worse as you approach that day. And Hagen was disturbed. And he cried out again to God, God, what can we do? Is this all we have to look forward to in America? And all of a sudden, it was like he stepped into another world and God showed him a huge ball of fire coming down from heaven, heading for the United States. And he said it got bigger and bigger and bigger, this ball of fire. And over the United States... Before it hit the ground, it exploded, 
and there were just all these little fires going all over the United States and everywhere they went, people were filled with the Holy Spirit. They began speaking in tongues and prophesying and it launched the greatest revival this nation has ever seen. And it was not an epidemic, not just in Pensacola, not just in Toronto, not just in Hot Springs, Arkansas. It went all over the United States. It was pandemic. Christians were rising up. Now, if that happens, and if we can interpolate from previous revivals of the number of people that were saved in a community, Say the Cane Ridge revivals, like 80% of the people were saved. If we pray and say, God, revive our land, and this spiritual fireball hits us, and people are filled with the Holy Spirit and start standing up as ambassadors for Christ, what if 40% of our nation came to Christ? Let's just say 40% of our nation came to Christ, and then Jesus came for his church. That would leave 60% of the United States, but the 40% that went were some pretty heavy taxpayers. They're going to lose the tax income of that 40% of the people, and just by losing that 40% of the tax base, America will have no choice but to be a satellite of the new Europe and go into the final Shabua, the great tribula the tribulation period, then the great tribulation that was long awaited for. So here it is. Take your position. Are you willing to take, if you're going to take your position as an ambassador of Christ, stand to your feet. You remember you're an ambassador of another world. And always remember this. When we have ambassadors in a nation and then we're going to war with that nation and we're going to bomb that nation, we always take our ambassadors home first. Or we're supposed to. God will not let a hair on your head perish if you're walking with him. And he's going to call you home before his wrath pours out on this earth or this nation. Love others enough to bring them to Jesus. Put your hand on your heart and say, Lord, make me salty. Lord, make me salty. And remind me to pray for America every day. Help me be a diligent discerner of the times so I don't become a hypocrite. Help me know how to vote. And above all, help me walk with you every day. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, there will be ministers at the altar. I don't know how I run out of time so fast. There's a lot I had to skip over. We'll cover some of it on Tuesday evening. But I know this, you are chosen of the Lord for this hour. God loved us enough to find Jesus or him find us. God loved us enough to be a part of this generation that's seeing the convergence of all the eschatological signs that point to his coming. He didn't raise us up just to watch TV to gripe about our nation, to watch the news all day long. He didn't raise us up just to talk about catastrophes in various parts of the world and terrorism attack. He raised us up to be ambassadors for his kingdom. Now let's be ambassadors. You know what? When you're an ambassador for Christ, he gives you the checkbook too. How about that? If you're here and you're not right with God, I know how to pray a 30-second prayer if you're really sincere. We'll all just pray that prayer right now. And if this is the first time you're praying this or if you're coming back to God today, 
I want you to tell somebody as you leave and see the ministers at the altar, they can get you a Bible, and a book by Pastor Kevin. Just say this with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for me. Forgive me of all my sins. I believe you were raised from the dead. And I believe you're coming again. Come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. You are my only hope of ever having a home in heaven. Thank you, Jesus. I'm saved. My sins are gone. And I have a new start in life beginning now. Amen. Amen. I pray the Lord bless you and the Lord protect you and watch over you and your family. I pray the Lord help you rise up as the ambassador he's called you to be. I pray that the love of Jesus will flow from you to every person you meet, wherever it is. I pray that people will know you care about them. You don't just want to preach at them, but you care about them enough to give them the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray the Lord raise you up in these days to receive one of those balls of fire and be filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit. And as the Bible says in the last days, some of God's people will rise up and do exploits. I pray that you will be an exploit believer, doing greater things. And I pray this as a blessing for you. I speak it, I believe it, and therefore I decree it. In the name of the Father and of the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen, amen. God bless you, ambassadors.